We've finished our 2018 Bike of the Year testing. The results are in. And as per tradition, we're going to talk about what we discovered this year. We're also going to look forward to 2019, what's going to come next year. I'm joined by senior tech editor Warren Rossiter. He's been responsible for much of the testing during Bike of the Year 2018. And we also have a special guest, Yanto Barker. He's a former pro cyclist. He's ridden for UK Youth Rally, and his last team was One Pro Cycling. But now he's better known as the founder and the man behind Lecole Cycling Clothing. And he's going to give us a pro's view on cycling technology. I think we should kick off with what is probably one of the most controversial subjects in cycling, if not the world at the moment, Rim brakes and disc brakes. We talked a lot about disc brakes last year because last year was probably the first year that discs were really making an impact. This year, our Bike of the Year test, we've tested over 40 bikes, but it's 50-50 rim and disc. And rim brake bikes have done really, really well. The winning bike, the Giant TCO Advance 2, that's a rim brake bike. So, well, in fact, you know, all of our price point category winners are all rim brake bikes as well. Mm. So, so they should be. <laughs> Why? I mean, we, we get a lot of letters from people, uh, I guess on both sides of the argument, they don't like seeing so many disc brake bikes. So Yanta, when you were racing, you, I mean, you, you've been ra you were a racer for 20 years, you obviously started off with rim brakes. What are you riding now? I'm still on rim brakes. So why are you still on rim brakes? Um, I don't think that disc brakes have really got there yet. Um, um, I was kind of thinking earlier, there's there's a very specific uh, decision that I made in my mind where rim brakes and disc brakes become appropriate or inappropriate. And if it's okay to skid the wheels, disc brakes are fine. If it's not, they're not fine. When's it okay to skid the wheels? Off-road. Okay. Yeah, basically. Because <laughs> yeah. if you're skidding on road, you go, you're going down generally, yeah. or you're very, very close to yeah. it. Because if there's any skidding... But I think, I, actually, you know, to, just to counter that, I think that when you get really good hydraulic systems, like, like the latest generation Shimano, um, Latest generation SRAM on the ETAP HRD, uh, and actually the new Campag discs. Um, because the everything about them is so tunable, like lever throw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yeah, you can lock a wheel, but I actually think it's it's easier not to lock a wheel with a disc brake bike than it is, say, a, a high-end road bike running carbon rims, where you do get a bit of degradation when heat starts to build up in the brake forcing, and then you end up grabbing big fistfuls, like when you barreling into a corner and you tend to lock. Yeah, I've, I lock more wheels riding a, a rim brake bike on carbon rims mm. and I know I own both than you do on a disc. I think the, the, what disc affords you once you once you get become accustomed to it and adapt to it is there's so much more feel there. I do think there are there are disadvantages with discs um, at the moment. Nobody's actually fully cured the noise problem mm. when you get a heat builder. That's a problem or, for me as yeah, well. Yeah. Or you know or when pads get glazed or whatever then you get that squeak and that they're a little bit more prone to judo when they're badly maintained, which can be a bit disconcerting. And there's still a little bit of a weight penalty. Um, I've got to be honest, I'm also really bad at mechanics myself, and it might sound bad, but I've had someone to do it most of my career. So when it comes to disc brakes, like, they're much more complicated. And even just the thought of having to do something is like, like overwhelms me. <laughs> That's certainly true. I mean, it's much more easy to get your head around just in a rim brake than it is Say having to bleed a, a set of disc brakes or change the you know even change the pads can fill people with dread because you're dealing with springs and you've got to make sure that you know the the uh, the pistons you know pushed into the right place and that sort of thing and and I think that, lost me <laughs> well yeah yeah but it's just one of it's, it's it is one of those kind of learning curve things I mean maybe that's why um, the, the disc thing has has had more of an effect on uh, the general riding public rather than rather than racers you know. Um, uh, there are quite a lot of us out there that are quite nerdy and quite like that kind of tinkering thing with it. And you're, you're riding rims at the moment, when do you think you'll swap over or will you never? Um, I'll never say never, so I'm quite a progressive person, I'm, I'm always looking for what the uh, performance advantages might be and as a pro you know, I'd, I would train very hard, I don't want to waste anything and if I felt, if I felt like I could get a, a performance advantage on a piece of equipment I would definitely want to adopt it. I'm not, you know, old school kind of never say never and all that kind of thing. So um, potentially I would in the future, and I think the, d the distinguishing feature for me would be uh, when they can change the wheels as quickly as we can currently change rim brake wheels, then I would, I'd move across then. Warren, our bike of the year is a rim brake bike. You've said that ordinary punters, they, they want disc brake bikes, the disc brake bikes are really good for them, yet we've chosen a rim brake bike. Why? 
sell it through uh, The reason that rim brake bikes have done so well in this year's Bike of the Year is there are some massive bargains to be had for rim brake, yeah, for rim brake frame technology. Because, you know, be, be as it may, you know, it, it is sort of older models, um, even though, you know, Specialized launched the new Tarmac as a rim brake model, but now they've got the disc one. And rumor is like from next year, the disc version is going to be the predominant model in the range. In fact, the, the rim brake model is S-Works only and probably frame set only. All the R&D money, all the development is now going to go into disc. But what that does mean is that at this point for 2018, probably going into 2019, rim brake road bikes are fantastic. Our winning bike, the Giant TCR Advance 2, that comes with, well basically, it comes missing tubes. It's tubeless ready. It's set up for tubeless tyres. I'll start with you, Yanto. Tubeless tyres, where do you stand? Don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> too much too much change unnecessary. Like what's what's the what's the benefit? It's marginal, marginal for extra complexity. I don't understand them. They're mucky and messy to change because they've got, you know, stuff inside and they're not, you know, the valve's not connected to the tire. It just too much already. <laughs> Warren, do well, you like them? I do, I do. I mean, I, I don't think they're without fault. Um, again, it's quite, a, it's quite an early uh, adoption into, into the road scene. And when they're good, they're easy to fit, they're easy to inflate and everything's great. And when they're bad, you can be struggling for hours and hours and hours. But the, the big advantage that you do have with a tubeless is um, there's less mass, there's lower rolling resistance, um, they're, they're the kind of science takes on it and the, you know, the mechanical testing that's been done on it. But for the actual rider out there, it eliminates one of the most annoying punches you can have and that's the pinch puncher. It just doesn't happen. You know? And again, we come around to the, the, the push forward with disc brakes coming onto bikes, which is allowing bigger tyres. Bigger tyres work better in a, in a tubeless setup than with a tube. You know? Why? Well, you can take advantage of what a bigger tyre gives you. You can run at lower pressure. So you can get more comfort, um, which obviously is great for, for you know, some of those experiences outside of mainstream road cycling. You know, we get into gravel, tubeless is the way to go. In, in cyclocross, tubeless is making a really big impact into that. You know, one, one of my tech writers, Robin, who's been cross racing for you know more than 30 years, you know, a big, you know, this is a man that would spend months and months preparing for his season, getting all his tubs ready, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Last season he went tubeless only and he's now he won't go back. Is this convincing you in any way? No, I'm smiling because I've also spent 20 years where I just ride what I'm given. <laughs> and you sold me, if the team wants to use tubeless, fine. Yeah. You know, I, I, don't need to, I don't need to know. Lower pressures, faster resistance, performance gains, fine. But if I have to do it myself, that's a problem. So if you talked to me two years ago, not an issue. If you talk to me now, it's not happening. <laughs> the simple fact is, you know, using tubeless for quite, quite a, a lot now is that when you're riding around an inner tube bike, most of the punches you get end up being pinch punches. It's just when you hit a pothole or hit something hard, you know, and you get that, that pinch flat. Um, that just doesn't happen on, on tubeless. And actually, most tubeless tires are really good at sealing from like small flints and, and thorn intrusions. It's only if you actually get a tear, which if you have got a tear on a, on a clincher tire, you'd probably be walking anyway. I think there's a little bit of industry-led we need to kind of revamp everything, get everyone buying everything new again. And for me, there's a little bit of skepticism and I feel I, like that comes yeah, through a little bit. Yeah, possibly. But I think that's always been the case. I mean, you know, I, I've been around long enough to remember when STIs came in and people saying, well, we don't need these. What on earth do we need this for? It's too complex. There's too much complexity here. Even going back to clickless pedals. Why on earth do I want to attach my feet to my pedals mechanically when I've got these great straps? It's, it's just, you know, it's progress. What's the thing that, that made the most difference to you as a cyclist in your in your 20 years as a as a rider, um, you know, racing? What what made the biggest difference? Aero road frames, okay. massive difference. And I had the opportunity to ride. Um, I was an extra in a film, and I rode a 1994 steel bike, uh, a 2001 carbon bike, very very first one, a 2004 carbon bike, and then my current carbon bike which I was riding in 2013 and I got to ride them all in the same day and that was quite unique yeah. and there was a huge difference, massive difference in one, stiffness, two, responsiveness, three, aerodynamics once you actually got up to speed and I ride an aero frame at the moment um, partly because it's not any heavier than the standard frame but it's also aero so as soon as you get up above 40 k's an hour there is a perceived speed difference and the power required to 
maintain it. And aero frames, I guess, was something that we talked about a lot two, three, four years ago when they were really coming through. Um, how have you noticed the sort of difference in the bike you're riding now and the ones? How, how have they changed? Yeah, they've also changed. Uh, I mean, I've ridden a lot, so and I've also paid a lot of attention to what's happening when I'm riding and what's making a difference. And I think carbon technology has come on a huge amount. While we've had carbon bikes for a long time, they're, the way they uh, structure the weave and the way they bolster certain areas to give you that strength but not adding weight because they just put it everywhere. So early carbon bikes were just kind of rigid, rigid, very uncomfortable. You actually almost had to ride less uh, tire pressures to just compensate for that. Now you've got all the strength in the place you need it and then you save the weight on the other, other areas that just don't need so much of that particular torque or strain um, kind of bolstering. So that, that's been a massive change for me. Same with, same with uh, wheels as well, I would say. It changes, when you ride an aero bike, it changes the mentality that you ride it with. So I remember first getting on a real proper, it was a Cervelo uh, aero bike, S5, and uh, I, I started riding in a more aerodynamic position. I'm like, well, I've got the bike, I've got the wheels, why would I waste it sitting up too much? I started training tucked up, I would do 100 miles, 34 k's an hour on my own. You know, that was, that was a significant step in the right direction. But the catalyst was the frame and it's giving you it so make the most of it do everything else do the kit do the you know shoes overshoes whatever you know something that's become very noticeable over the, the last few years of bike of the year is that more and more brands are putting their own wheels on their own stems their own saddles own brand componentry is becoming the norm in many cases how do you, why is that, how do you feel about it, Yeah, and so have you got a view on own brand components? Yeah, I've kind of got two views, one from a business owner point of view, I think it's a really good idea, I would, I would definitely look to expand our range and make sure we kind of deliver the whole bike, if you like, um, but from a consumer point of view, I feel like I'm looking for brands that I know will deliver quality in those parts, and you don't always get that same reassurance if it's a, you know, a new product that's now being included into the bike that they didn't used to do that, so a bit of a conflict. Own brand parts. You know, five years ago, ten years ago, tended to be um, bought off catalogue uh, products out of the Far East, uh, and they'd just stick a logo on it. You know, that was as far as the thinking went. And it tended to be on those kind of lower end bikes. And um, when they got higher in, they wanted to get, you know, you wanted to get Mavic on in, in your wheels. You wanted 3T or Deda or Chinelli or whatever for your bar stems, etc., because it does add a big cachet. You know, you wanted a branded saddle rather than an own brand saddle. We're actually seeing those own brand products are now transcending just from being something that seems to be, you know, that historically was for budgetary reasons. Now it actually seems to be to progress. I've been fortunate to visit, you know, Trex R&D facilities and, and specialised R&D facilities. And you see the amount of investment they're putting in. You know, specialised built their own wind tunnel to, to develop their own products, you know. Uh, uh, Trex R&D department is, is staffed with some brilliant, brilliant engineers who are just solely concentrating on, on progressing that, you know, uh, and it's not, it's not just creating, you know, say a more aero wheel or anything like that, they're actually looking at um, engineering solutions, construction techniques to actually make a better product, uh, as well as making a more performance oriented product. And how do you both feel about, say, putting giant components on a non-giant bike naming, I'm not going to name any names, but you know, if you put... Oh, yeah, but I had an interesting thing with that recently. I mean, I put a shot of on Instagram of me riding my Roubaix uh, and testing a set of Bontrager on wheels on it. And people were like, oh, you're crossing the streams. It's, you know, the response was, it was, and I, I find that kind of odd because I almost now consider, because the, the quality you're getting from Bontrager wheel line, it transcends just being something from Trek, you know. Uh, it's been I, interesting I, talking to you, and you're a tech geek, yeah, yeah. and I'm a brand geek, so <laughs> yeah. I would absolutely never do that. In the same way, I would never wear, you know, mixed brands of clothing. Or, oh, I would never or, do that. Well, well, I would see, I would yeah. see doing what you just talked about then as the same yeah. sort of level. So that would be a no-no for me. But I can see that evolving as um, it comes. They they become recognised more for those components, and they have respect in their own right. Then definitely, it's going to reduce the kind of kind of clunkiness of what that looks like when guess, you're mixing yeah. those products. But I think, like, I don't think many people would have a problem putting a, say, a specialised power saddle on any bike. No, so, uh, saddles and shoes, I think, yeah. are slightly exempt from any of the criteria because they're all about personal feel and in yeah. the same way that teams don't, uh, they don't force you to wear certain shoes or ride certain saddles because you have to, you know, you have yeah. to get on with it, um, then they kind of get a special, you know, wild card. Yeah. 
Let's talk about Shimano group sets. Uh, specifically, let's talk about 105. That's, um, that, that's pretty big on, on a lot of the bikes this year for, for varying reasons. We're all quite excited, I think. Are we all quite excited about 105 R7000, which is, is coming on next year? What are you expecting to see with that? How's that going to change things? How does it all compare to Ultegra, Warren? I think you know any any new release of 105 is always a good thing because you get to see the trickle down of the the great things they do at the higher end, um, and for the new group, I think that's more prevalent than ever. You know, the, it does look like a facsimile of Ultegra, which you know, which is fantastic. It will be slightly heavier. There'll be some you know slightly uh, weightier components in there, just based on price. You know, steel bolts in replace of alloy ones, etc. But um, if it functions. The way new Ultegra functions, it will be it will be the go-to group set. And we're talking group sets, so why don't we talk about electronic group sets? You know, Yanto, are you a convert to electronic at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, partly because I mean, I ride Shimano Di2, and it's excellent. I mean, zero maintenance. It's the easiest thing in the world to use, and I have got friends. So I'm kind of coming from a consumer point of view, where I've ridden maybe a thousand hours a year uh, for the last sort of twenty something years, and in that time you do get a feel for what's working, what's not, what's smooth, what's a little bit clunky and for me Shimano wins are on two points which are really important. One, it looks great and every time they do a new development I'm always really happy and I think that's, that's a nice move forward, that's a good step. And two, it functionally works so well, like I literally spend two minutes you know, adjusting gears and stuff in a whole year's worth of riding, so a thousand hours and that's real testament to the engineering that's gone into that. Now Campy, Campag, however you like to call it, I think does a really good job. It looks beautiful, but when it comes to functionality, it really is missing something, and I've got friends who use it, and you know, I'm talking about the one time in that thousand hours, or the two times more, or whatever. Um, and equally, uh, SRAM ETAP, which I've not actually used, I believe works very, very well, but it just doesn't look as nice. And for me, I need it to do both. Uh, on the Campagnolo, who knows? Um, Campagnolo, I think, made a quite a bad business decision a few years ago where they stopped supporting that low end. We saw the disappearance of um, Mirage and Xeon. So it, it, my, my problem is, where are the new Campagnolo customers coming from? Pretty, I, I'm pretty certain that most Campag sold is record or super record, and it's bought by guys our age who are having really expensive custom bikes made, and they want super record because it looks beautiful. But that's not gonna, that's not gonna keep your factories running. So there you have it, there was plenty to talk about following 2018's Bike of the Year. Thanks to Yanto and Warren for, for, for joining in and keeping me entertained and on the straight and narrow. Let us know what you think in the comments below. <laughs>